Hey guys, welcome to the ATP Project. You're with your host, Steve-O, and me, Nick. Nick. How are you, Steve? Good, Nick. I'm really good. Yeah, good. Today we're going to have a deep dive into our bowels, aren't we? <laughs> we're diving into the bowels, Steve. Oh. <laughs> yeah, specifically, we're going to cover a condition that is becoming very, very prevalent, oh. a lot more common than it used to be. I'm seeing it a lot in clinic. I'm seeing yes. a lot of outside of clinic. Yeah. Diverticulitis. Dive of dire what? <laughs> Diverticulitis. Diverticulitis. That's yep. a mouthful. It is a bit of a mouthful. What's diverticulitis? Well, well, well let's talk about what diverticulitis yeah. is and then we'll talk about how prevalent it yep. is and then we'll talk about possibly why we're seeing more of it, what can <sighs> drive it and how we manage it and yep. all of that sort of thing. It's interesting because it I've heard diverticulitis, diverticulitis, di diverticular, yeah. diverticular, whatever. There's so, there's there's a lot so of many, isn't there? A lot we of better go through them. What, what's diverticulitis, giving the name itis at the end of it? So you know? itis means inflammation. Yes. So anything with itis in it means inflammation. So there, there's things called diverticular, yep. diverticular, and they are like little outpouchings in your colon. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they can just they can happen for different reasons, which we will go into. Oh. So that's what the little pouches are called. Yeah. So then there's something called diverticulosis. Osis, yeah. So that just basically means the presence yep. of these diverticular in mm. the colon. So that just means that they're there. Mm. Um, and then diverticulitis is when they become inflamed. So mm. those po those pouches actually get inflamed. That's called diverticulitis. Mm -hmm. And then diverticular disease mm -hmm. um, is when it becomes symptomatic. So, wow. Yeah. So okay. there it goes. So that's the progression. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Um, and I mean- this was first described in, in 1699, if you yeah, can believe that. I know. You've got a bit of the history on it there. Oh, absolutely. It was, that, was that done by Alexis Littre, which is a French surgeon. I like so it was all, that you put on that. Yeah, well, I always thought that was a pretty <laughs> impressive. It more right? Italian than French. But it's yeah. <laughs> Italian, French. What's the difference? <laughs> what uh, yeah, yeah, I don't I know. There's no French in Italian. But, but Littre was, was a very famous um, surgeon back then. He was he was a very famous bowel surgeon. And you got to remember, most bowel surgeries ended in the person dying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But but he was the first to describe these little pouches that were inflamed and, and there was a lot of surgeries done back then because they just thought, well, that, that's not supposed to be there, so we'll just chop Cut it out. out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people would get, you know, that because the anastomosis, which is where you join the two tubes back together, mm -hmm. would lick mm -hmm. back then. And yeah. so they'd leak into the peritoneum and they get peritonitis and die. Yeah. Okay. So there's no antibiotics back then. Remember it was yeah. in 1928 when Pasteur had the first antibiotics. So there's no, you, know, you got bad like bacterial that. infection in your you're gut, done. in your body, you're just, Okay. Yeah. So yeah. so he was the first to describe it and it was like, what do we do to treat that? Remember, no antibiotics back then, mm. no aspirins, no nothing. Mm. So they used to just cut them out. Mm. Um, and, and he was very famous because he, Littero was a, was a very famous um, surgeon of the day because he actually was one of the, the lecturers, mm. um, the, the key lecturers, for, for, say, the, the famous surgeon Petit. Mm. Which you said, oh, is he a small person? I did ask if he's a small person. That's funny, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, because because history is famous, cause, and he was the first guy. If, if ever has everybody heard of a tourniquet? Should should have should most people should have most had people? their blood pressure taken for one. Oh yes, so he's got that cuff. cuff. It's essentially essentially the same sort of yeah. thing. So basically, it cuts the blood supply off. Yeah, well, back then the, the way that you tighten the tourniquet was, if you imagine, and you see it, might see it in the old Western movies with a stick, a tightening yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Petit was the first to to invent that. Mm. And tourniquets still used this very day mm. in surgeries, like knee yeah. surgeries, and that they just blow them up, and after an hour they deflate them. Yeah. Um. So, but but that's where it all started, and and Petit uh, was was actually famous, uh, and and Littre, sorry, was the first guy to describe what a hernia is. Oh, there you go. And it's called the Litra Hermia, Hernia. Oh, <laughs> so, I love how they run names. Yeah. So he, he, he lived his life in the bowels. And, okay. and so, so he was the first to describe it. But, of course, nothing to do. So it's like, mm. you know, so so that's that's the history of this thing. It's quite incredible, isn't so it's it? It's been, you know, discovered a long, long time, long time ago. ago. It was published, if you look at PubMed, you can see them back of them pre-World War One, mm. where they started to uh, log what happened when people had surgery and, of course, most of them died. Yeah. There's no antibiotics until 28. Oh, and even then, it was really the Second World War that forced production of it in 39. Mm. So, so you know, diverticulitis has a long history. Mm, yeah. Um, and, and it's prevalent in a lot of people. So, so tell us about the prevalence. Yeah, so the prevalence. So it's it's actually can be a little bit difficult to, to actually um, see stats on actually how many people have it because a lot of people that have it remain asymptomatic. Yeah. So most people, I think it's less than... Um, I think I'll get to the stats, but I think it's less than ten percent. Yeah. Something of people that have diverticulitis, diverticulosis, actually yeah. end up with 
the, a symptomatic condition. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, it's been increasing a lot more over the years. Yeah. Um, and it does increase with age. Right. So got some data. I've tried to find a bit of data. So international data shows that colonic diverticular are present in more than 60% of people over 80 years of old, 80 Ugh. years of age and um, more than 50% in people over 60. So that's, that's over half much. the population of yeah, people half. who are 60 if you and see over a that, year have, old, um, that have the col- uh, colonic diverticular. So if you see a 60-year-old, the chances are they've probably You've got some got sort of outpocketing. Some, some, and the, the main way that it is actually found is for that reason. People are having colonoscopies for yeah. other reasons yeah. or other things and they discover it. So that's that's more how they, they find out they've even got it because they don't have any symptoms. Oh, yeah. I've, there's a great chart here in this paper that, that you just to go what you said about numbers. It's called Epidemiology, Patho- Pathology and Treatment of Diverticulitis and it was published in 2019. And you're right, 60% of men age 60 or anyone age, so male and female, mm. and less than 5% go on to develop this diverticulitis, so very low levels. But, but then most of them, it's uncomplicated. Yes. And so at six months, only 4% of them have it. Mm. But then you get 12% of that 5% get complex diverticulitis. Yeah, and that's when you talk about. That, that's when you've got to go that's serious shit. That's a lot worse. And we had, a, we had a, I won't mention their name, but there's someone at work here who had uh, quite a severe case of diverticulitis. Yeah. So it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. Like I said, I see a lot in clinic, a lot outside of clinic, friends, um, people around me that have, that have it, a lot of yeah. people. Yeah. Um, so, so diverticulosis yep. is a lot more common in Western countries. See, that's weird, isn't it? Yeah, and I think possibly to do with Western diet, oh, we'll get Western on that, style yeah. diet, typical Western um, shitty diet. A prevalence of between five and forty-five percent. So, in people who have a, a diverticul- diverticulosis, so left-sided um, colonic diverticular are found more in Western, the Western people. Mm-hmm. So um, more of that descent and the descending colon, you found it more in Western. In the sigmoid colon sigmoid too, colon. which is sort of, if you if you imagine this, it, there's a little tube that goes between your descending colon mm-hmm. and your rectum mm-hmm. and the sigmoid column's there. That, that's where it mainly hangs out. So it's easier to spy with a camera. Yeah. You just t- shoot a camera up there and turn left. That's it, exactly. I don't <laughs> Take don't left want to hand. sound too dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right. Um, but interestingly, um, 70 to 74% of people with African or Asian ethnicity have more right-sided diverticula, which is wow. the ascending colon and into the heart, uh, into sort of that transverse Isn't colon. Isn't that weird? Yeah. So, but they're finding now more, a, a lot more of the Asian population are now getting, sounds very confusing, um, the left-sided. Right. And they think it's more because of the Western style diets moving into the Asian Shitty countries Western more. diet infects them. <laughs> Western style diet. We've got a shit diet, Westerners. We really have, haven't we? As a general, yeah, the sad diet, yeah. standard Australian, standard American diet. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so that's just about 4%, there we go, of people will um, progress to diverticulitis that have diverticulitis. Wow. So, yeah. um, so younger males seems to be getting much more prevalent in younger males than it used to be. Wow. So much higher rate than was previously reported of younger males that, are, that the onset is. In New Zealand, data showed that between 2005 and 2015, there's nearly a 100% increase in cases admitted to hospital in men aged 30 to 54. Jeez. With diverticulitis. At my age, just. Just, yeah. But even I'm 30. from 30. Yeah, 30. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> just. You just make it in there, Steve. Um <laughs> Yeah, and this is, it's very similar trends overseas as well. So very it's getting worse. Yeah, a lot worse in men. Yeah. So um, and then there is more stats. So it is more prevalent in men. Yep. But then from the ages of sixty onwards, it's then flips and it's more prevalent in women. Ah. Yeah. So we, we don't know entirely the mechanism for yeah, that, but I've got some ideas. Yeah, we have got some ideas, but yeah. we, we can speculate. Certainly speculate. That'd be certainly yeah. a way to go. But but what an incredible stat! So really very common and getting common if that's Much such a more word. Common, yeah. I so, mean, I mean, we're 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 in a bit of trouble there. I mean, we are. You know, yeah. And, so, and there's two main forms of diverticulitis. There is. There? there is two main forms of diverticulitis. So there's mm-hmm. what something called SUD, <laughs> which is simple, uncomplicated diverticulitis. So it's not the foam in the in the sink. It's not the foam no. no, okay. in the sink. No, no. So there's no complications. No. And then there is complicated diverticulitis, which is associated. It also has a presence of some you know, abscess or fistula, mm. um, perforation, obstruction, hemorrhage. So, so <sighs> it becomes that's why it's called complicated diverticulitis because mm. there's a lot more complications involved. Um, there's acute diverticulitis yep. as well. So that can be complicated or uncomplicated. Yep. 
And then there's something called SCAD, which <laughs> is segmental colitis associated with diverticulosis. Oh, my God. And that's when there's um, segmental circum, uh, circumferential <laughs> colitic wall thickening. So this thickening of the tissues in the colon in, in like a spherical sort of rings. Yes. Um, that's actually really rare. Oh, so you don't good. see that. You would, wouldn't see that very often at all. But but the other two um, a, a lot more common. So um, so yeah. So really interesting. So what could yeah. what be cause it? What, what what are some of the risk factors? What what, 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 factors? what can you do to get this or not get it? Yeah. So some of the risk factors would be um, a genetic predisposition. Great. Like so a I'm lot screwed of regardless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So or I'm protected. I mean. I'm just trying to think. I don't think anyone in my family has diverticulitis or mm. diverticulosis or SCUD or SUD or any of those. Yeah. So that's good news. That is good news. My mum's had a colonoscopy a couple of years ago. Mm. She said, I'm never having that again. So <laughs> no, they didn't find anything, but it's yeah. just like, wow. So yeah. really bad. Yeah. So All yeah, right. so, so genetics can be genetics can be one that's Great. quite um, uh, a driver. Yep. Uh, chronic low-grade inflammation. Ah, well, what so, causes low-grade inflammation in the colon? Aside from the, the microbial inflammation, which oh, yeah. we will talk a little bit more about, yep. um, smoking, so that's inflammatory, obviously, um, obesity, physical inactivity, <laughs> high meat consumption, but mm. I'm going to talk maybe a little bit more about that as yeah. well. Um, so they ca- they're all possible risk factors that pe- that they're, sh- they're showing could be um, sort of risk factors for most diseases, isn't it? Well, Inactivity, for most. I mean, smoking. anything that causes inflammation yeah. can can lead to disease. So, mm. um, you know, most diseases start with inflammation. So, mm. you know, and if you have a propensity towards diverticulitis, then perhaps that's why if yeah. you've got inflammatory issues. That's where y- you could end up. Um, and then so then colonic dysbiosis, which is that. Inflammation, uh, imbalances between your beneficial bacteria and more mm. so inflammatory bacteria mm. or microbes in that colon. So low levels of short-chain um, fatty acid-producing bacteria, which we have talked about in the past. Yeah. So short-chain fatty af- acids, particularly butyrate, yes, really important for the health of a colon, so really protective. So um, low levels of bacteria that produce those short-chain I'm going to highlight acids. one in particular. Um, yeah. Later, because it's yeah. a really good one. It's a really good and we're one. We're going to get. We'll probably get that in the treatments because that's sort of. Yeah. A, yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So you've got to keep listening, or you won't find treatments, the answer. Yeah, treatments and management. Yep. Um, at the end, so hang in there. If so high or low fiber diet. Yeah, high, high or low fiber diet. So when mm-hmm. we'll talk about fiber um, and how that could be possibly a, a driver as well. Yep. Um, NSAID use. NSAID stands for non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. Yeah. So, so things like aspirins or even Indesid. Celebrex, Mobic, yeah, um, Meloxicam. Oh, Meloxicam is Mobic. Sorry, mm. um, but any of those NSAIDs, which mm-hmm. are which are non steroid anti inflammatory, so arthritis medication, naproxen, yep. Feldine, Oridus, those drugs, all that. So there's, I mean, I think you've got some stats on it. Um, oh, I've got some cool stats. That's right. Some, but there's a system, uh, systematic review, there is. Um, and meta and meta analysis found increased odds of perforation and abscess formation with opioid and NSAID use. Our opioid. Yeah, What's so opioid? opioids as well. So op- opioids and NSAIDs. Wow. So that can, or NSAIDs. So that could be. Um, uh, oh, I've got the coolest issue. chart. Now, this, yeah, this I really paper, like this. Yeah. This is really so, good. This is published in Epidemiology, Patho- Pathology, and Treatment of Diverticulitis, published in Gastroenterology. So like, this is like a real cool paper. Mm. And it gives you the risk factors and, and like, and we'll just go to the drugs. Um, wrong page. Uh, it's it's just the the drugs gives you actual numbers. So so how yeah. bad is it really? Yeah, and how what you know how many times a week? Yeah, you know seems to increase your risk for taking these, these medications. Table. table one, this is it's a big paper that way. Yeah, it's, it's a massive it? paper, and, and and there's some other food stuff in here too. Mm. So it's quite interesting. Okay, so medication, non aspirin NSAID. So this would be like Panadol. Yeah. Now, if you have it twice a week, you're increasing your odds of diverticulitis by. Seventy-two percent. Mm. Crazy. That's Panadol. Yeah. That's like every man and his dog takes Panadol. Oh, yeah. do, dogs or cats, it's toxic don't Panadol. Don't give it to, don't, don't give it to your dog. Um, aspirin um, gives it increase by by thirty-two percent. Mm. All NSAIDs together is sixty-two percent increase. Mm. Mm. Um, and corticosteroids. Oh, a lot, be... a lot of people on steroids, don't they? Yeah, there is quite a few. Two hundred and sixteen percent increase. Really, risk. gee, yeah. wow, that's huge, isn't it? I mean, um, and obviously these. This sorry, isn't any. Yeah, two hundred and seventy-four percent increase. That's even more so. This isn't everybody that takes those medications will end up with diverticulitis. But yeah. as as we said, if you have a propensity towards it, then yep. that then you then that's something that really um, can be a 
pretty strong driver. Yep. And, and pain I've meds, seen it in clinic. Like, like opioids, you mentioned before being yep. bad, yep. 216% increased risk. Really? Wow. And what about vitamin D? Vitamin D, Halves yeah. your risk. Yeah, I've got some good stats. Oh, I've got vitamin oh. D coming up actually. Oh, have you? Oh, shit, I gave it away. You gave it away, Steve. <laughs> but um, one, one thing I found interesting was statin use, was it, it lead to an in- decrease uh, risk. Yeah, like you said that. I thought, found that interesting. Yeah, well, so, I, I, I think that's to do with um, suppressing the immune system and yeah. it stops that, that inflammation, which is very interesting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so that's really interesting with the medications. And look, how many people are on medications for different things? Oh, yeah. And how I have seen quite a lot of cases where people have pre existing issues, injuries, like things like that, yep. and chronic pain, and they need pain management. Yep. Um, and so then they've been had a lot of pain management over the years, a lot of um, medications, and ended up with diverticulitis. So amazing! Can, know, can I give you some? Um, you know, you mentioned um, the, probably the worst thing, for, and you mentioned this before. And I'm going to give you hit you with some numbers. Okay. You may not know these numbers, but if your BMI is high, like body mass index mm-hmm. over thirty, mm-hmm. you've got an increased risk of four hundred and forty percent wow in some studies Jeez, that's isn't awesome, that isn't remarkable that's crazy so yeah. if you want diverticulitis get fat and you get pretty much <laughs> diverticulitis yes but there's there's more ways to increase it if you're inactive mm. it increases it dramatically yeah but if you're active it cuts it by about a third yeah you said running didn't you running uh, intense exercise was the best thing they found yeah isn't that amazing that's funny now Fibre, yep, it cuts it by almost half. Mm. But here's some running thing. What about eating nuts? Is that good or bad? Um, that's interesting. We haven't. You just skip them way ahead oh, of me. Sorry, we'll get to that. We'll so sticking with the program, but that's yeah, okay. We'll no, but we will. But we will go back and talk about diet yeah. because the nut seeds, popcorn type, yeah. um, contentious <laughs> argument. Very contentious. Um, Leave so, it hanging. So other pr- issues that can drive it, um, obesity, as you said. Yep. So uh, huge, quite a p- significant risk factor. Um, yeah, so uh, there's there's a study here, another study here. So um, women with a body mass index higher than 30 hmm. were twice as likely to um, end up with diverticulitis. See, women, yeah. And that's... complications of diverticulitis, sorry. So yeah. perforations, um, abscess, things like that. Um, and hip to weight ratio has been an in, shown to be an independent risk for complica- complications as well. Yeah, so, so women should have larger hips yeah. than men. Yeah. Um, and their ratio should be about 0.8. Yes. So the waist should be smaller waist than the hips. Should be smaller than the hips. Should be. It should be, yeah. And if it isn't, it's a little bit problematic. Men yeah. should be about one to one because men are boring. We've yeah. got no shape Waves whatsoever. Just We're straight, just straight flat up, up and down. down. I, know. I don't know why no you'd be interested in looking at men. There's no There's curves There's nothing the to them. No curves. <laughs> nothing. Just a lot of hair. <laughs> well, I guess it depends on the man, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and low vitamin D status, Steve. So this is the vitamin oh, D. Oh, D. Yeah. Um, so there's mechanisms linking vitamin D uh uh, deficiencies to diverticular Ooh, disease in um, animal studies. Yeah. And supplementation has been shown to support gastrointestinal immunity. And we all know that vitamin D is involved in immune function. Yep. Um, so that's really important. And also barrier function as well. So gut barrier function, vitamin D is vitally important there as well. Ah, these too, yeah. So if you have low levels, that can be um, uh, that can be a, a factor in it as well. Um yeah, so research into other diseases associated with vitamin D deficiency and disordered collagen and elastin indicate that it has antifibrotic action. So vitamin D wow. can help to reduce thickening and scarring of tissue as well. Amazing. So, yeah, so that's um, that's another reason to make sure your vitamin D levels are good. Um, and when we say good, we like to see them. Our doctors, uh, anything over 50 and you're mm. adequate. And you are adequate over 50, but you don't want to be adequate. You want to be optimal. Yeah. So optimum will be around 100. Yeah. And it should, the, the range like doctors give you is 50 to 150. Yeah. So you want to be over 100. Over 100. And if you, you know, you, ha- you have immune issues, you might even say up to 120. Yeah. 100, you know, sort of around Mine's there. 153. So. I just don't know how I remember that, but that oh, was my wow. last test. Yeah. That's oh, right. Well, there you go. So, hmm. yeah. so yeah. So we're going to make I'm sure. Brown as a berry. Look at me. You are very brown. That's true. You I go out outside there. to do intense exercise. You do. You're always swimming, running, something yeah. or other. But that's. You, you can combine them both. You can get vitamin D and do intense yeah. exercise at the same time. You can, yeah. You know, get that for the treatment. But, but I mean, you know, just think about that mm. for a sec. It's no brainer, isn't it? It is a no brainer. Great yeah. for your heart, reduce cancer risk, all that. All those good things. So, so what are some of the other risk factors 
Yeah, um, some of the other. There, there's two groups. There's controllable and non-controllable. Yeah, like you said, getting old. I'm getting old. Yeah, so, so factors you cannot control yeah. is age. Great, and obviously the the rate of um, increases as we get older, as we said. Yeah. Um, so genetics, as we said, um, sex, as we said, so male, so all the things basically we said, and anyone that has um, uh, connective tissue disorders. On me. <laughs> like you. Oh, yes, yeah, Steve. So you may not have the family. <laughs> the family. Shit, I'm old, um, I'm blind. Genetics factor. You said sex, I'm married, so I don't have much of that, so that doesn't help. <laughs> you, <don't have> <laughs> you pretty much cover all disorder. these all these. You do. What? So anything that, um, that you know, impacts that internal structure, that, that, yeah. that disrupts that internal structure, that holds things together. Jeez. And so autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, yep. um, scleroderma, lupus, yep. Yep. Maffron syndrome, Ellis, Dan- Ellis Danos syndrome as well. That's so, amazing. Yeah, news. so that's like bendy one yeah, so um, bend. you know, I say that because I've got bendy arm yeah. we've both got double jointed elbows don't we steve elbows. we got weird it well, I won't put it on elbows. camera I think no, I've done that once because not everyone good. got a complaints yeah. yeah not good good but uh, but they say if you bend you're on the outside you can be bendy on the inside as well so yeah. this um, so that but can I'm, be. I'm not flexible in any way shit this no, shit but you, I can't you, touch you, my toes you, you, you the arthritis situation which yeah, you, yeah. so it's a bit screwed mind you I I Oh, my partner did listen to one of these the other day, but he generally doesn't listen to anything. I, I, I doesn't listen to the podcast, and um, he's, he's trying to get him to stretch a bit because he's got back injuries from his old um, career. Ah. Um, I said you need to stretch your lower back, so we're going to touch his toes. <laughs> he got to his knees. <laughs> I can it. get just past my knees. Yeah, I'm like, come a- on. So yes, but men are a lot of men. Not all men. I shouldn't judge, but tend to be a bit tighter in the hamstrings. For some oh, reason. tight. Jeez. Yeah, but anyway, so yeah, so um, right. so there's some of the non-controllable. So, so what what can I do to control my risk factors? So, so some of the controllable yeah. risk factors. So these are things you can change. All right. All right? So gonna... low fiber diets can be um something that you can change. Yeah. So one of the the possible um drivers they say is low fiber diet. So that can cause um uh that sort of colon to be to have sort of um, be stretched out. So if you've got if you're constipated, mm. so if you have low fiber diet, you can have constipation stretches out that colon and can create um, damage um, and also um, dysbiosis. So if you have stool sitting in your colon for a longer time mm. than you should, it can create more issues with pathogenic overgrowth, overgrowth yeah. of more of those inflammatory microbes yeah, yeah. and things. Um, so and obviously higher fibre will help to have you more regular Good. bowel movements and things like that. Good. So you can change that. A high red meat intake, Steve. yeah. I, I feel like one day we should do a whole podcast on red meat and the dangers should. of red meat because there uh, there's a lot of factors involved in that and there's a lot of research when you really look into the research in high red meat consumption or red meat consumption in general mm. um, that the research is a little bit grey into it's, how it's they It's grey because they, they do correlation studies and correlation yeah. doesn't mean causation in yeah. science. So, so, for example, let's take America, which is what they do, North America, mm. and they look at the red meat consumption there and it's usually steak and chips. Mm. Or hamburgers. They eat a lot of hamburgers in America, oh, yeah. in Australia. What do they but, call it? Um, uh, not loose meat. <laughs> what do they call that stuff? Loose meat. We call it minced meat. They call it um something. What do they call it? I can't remember. What do they, they call it? it? I think it's like it's loose, loose meat. Sounds a bit rude <laughs> to me. Meat. Matt's going to Google. We're going to Google what the, no, what, so what call do they call mince in America? They don't call it mince meat. They call it something else. Hmm. Yeah, it's not. It's not Weedos. something like loose meat. Just I don't know. Half People, any Americans listening probably think I'm an idiot. Yeah. Um. Yes. So. It's funny, isn't it? Yeah, so that and also a lot of the studies they did, they didn't distinguish between processed red meat and Correct. non-processed. Ground beef. Ground beef. I don't know where I got loose meat oh, from. Yeah, loose meat. <laughs> ground beef. Ground so beef. Ground beef in America. So um they eat a lot of ground beef. Um so yeah, so the high red meat intake. Yeah. I think, yes, definitely there is a factor there. Um mm. I mean in the studies that I saw, it was anything above 116.6 grams. Per day, just which spiral. seems like nothing. Like that's nothing. So I don't, I don't wear that. But um, uh, that that's about a quarter of a pound yeah, if you want the old that's nothing, American. Yeah. Thing. So I don't, I don't go by that. But um, but look, if you're already having issues in inflammation, and but I and I had this this discussion with someone the other day. Red meat, don't char it because then it increases a lot of the inflammatory mm. um, factors and chemicals in it, that sort of thing. Have a good grass fed. Mm. And I know we've talked about grass fed that every all meat's grass fed, which it is initially. Um, but yeah, so there's so there's factors around med, red meat, but you don't want to be overdoing it. And look, a lot of men eat red, a lot of meat. I have people close to me that eat a lot of meat, so they might eat meat three times a day and big amounts. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I have people close to me that do do that. 
So um, that to me would be a high. When intake. I work on a farm, I have three three serves of red. I mean, that, well, that's that's very common in uh, uh, cattle farmers. Feel they great. do. It. Yeah. It's a roar. Yeah, so so that can be part of part of it. So um, so re- high red meat intake can may or may not be yeah. something that should should be looked at. Low vitamin D status, obviously, we can fix that. So we can go out in the sun. You can yeah. have supplementation if mm-hmm. you can't get your levels up. If you do supplement and you can't get your levels up, a lot of time it can be low magnesium. Yes. So if you you're struggling to get vitamin D levels up, look at your magnesium levels, get down yeah. to some magnesium, and that could help as well. And D three is the form we want to supplement. D three, yeah. yeah. Definitely. So, and it's cheap. That like vitamin D oh, is very cheap. It's disgracefully cheap. Yeah, it is. So, so that's another one. Um, uh, SIBO. So that could be that, that could be Small another intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yeah, and that's something we've talked about in the yeah, past as well. Um, so that's something that obviously we can um, rectify that dysbiosis. As we said, you can you can give up smoking, <laughs> um, and you can get out and exercise. So the sedentary lifestyle. So they're all factors that contribute that you can change. Yeah. So if you have a propensity for it. Really um, interesting. Um, and, and there's also other risk factors. Yeah, so the, a lot of the ones that we've talked about, so metabolic disease, so metabolic ah, issues, yeah. um, you know, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, mm-hmm. all of that sort of thing, cardiovascular, well, cardiovascular risk uh, disease and then also diverticulitis can be a risk for cardiovascular disease. So but course, either or yeah. in that regard. Um, yeah, antibiotic, antibiotic use, Steve. Yeah. This is an interesting one. <laughs> That's a really interesting one because yeah. if you look up um, Merck Gold Standard Treatment for Diverticulitis, guess what it is? Antibiotic. Antibiotic. It's usually one that's poorly absorbed because it's got to yeah. make it all the way through. So yeah. you, they give them things like vancomycin. Yeah. Um, but um, that's poorly absorbed, yeah. so it gets through to the, the sigma colon. Yeah, but, yeah. So there's it's an also issue. A risk factor. It's, it is a risk factor. So and the thing that I see, and this is the cycle, and we'll talk about in treatments, but. You know, someone, if they're having acute diverticulitis or complicated acute diverticulitis and they're having a flare, and, and I've seen people that can have flares every month, every two months. Yeah. So they could be on medication, on antibiotics every few months. So those continual courses of antibiotics. So that, yes, it does get rid of the infection and um, inflammation and all of that sort of thing. But then, of course, you're left with a decimated microbiome. Yeah. So th- the first thing that grows back is the more pathogenic and inflammatory microbes over like the Klebsiella. healthy. Yeah, because that that's resistant to antibiotic these days. Yeah. So you're just gonna it's gonna go there, kill all the good guys, and leave the bad guys to thrive. Yeah, exactly. I've got some good tips on how to get rid of Klebsiella. Very oh. easy, easy tips, and I've seen it quite quite a lot. Where were you 30 years ago when I needed that? I know. I thought of you, Steve, when I started Shit, doing this um, treatment. But um, but yeah. So antibiotic use is, is a difficult one because it's the treatment, and it can be the cause. Yep. And it can be a continuation of flares. So so that's breaking that cycle is really important, yeah. so that we can stop the flares, so that you don't have to keep going back to the antibiotics. Because obviously. You do need them if you've got a significant flare, oh, a significant yeah. infection. Obviously, antibiotics you need you need to have them. So, um, cause and a consequence, basically. So, um, and the medications, as we spoke about, and HRT past HRT use. Yeah, I saw that there, but yeah. I, I didn't look it up. What 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 what's the go with HRT? Yeah, so HRT. So I so this is where I think, and this is one of my one of the theories about how why women may show more prevalence in their 60s, more, mm-hmm. more so than earlier, because a lot of women, not all women, but a lot of women will go into HRT when they're sort of, you know, even in the mid-40s, some women, but even from 50 on. Yeah. And they're usually coming off at about 10 years post-menopause, mm. that sort of thing. So, yeah, or you 60. should be. Um, so, so sort of that's around that 60-ish age. Yeah. So they're coming off their HRT. So is it maybe, I don't know if it's protective while you're on it, or if it, but perhaps that's a driver for the HRT. And also um, anabolics for men. And that could also be why possibly in some populations of younger men, why there's more prevalence now because of anabolics. So they go on the roids. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that so I found that quite interesting actually. So they, did, this is natural muscle. If you, I know, if you, well, I, I can't home believe it, Steve. I can't believe I know, it. It's rippling, isn't it? Yeah, it what is. What did rippling. you say? I got the same body as, as Chris Seabum or something you were saying the other day? Yeah, Chris Sebum, yeah. yeah. Identical Steve, identical. Super, it's like looking into a, uh, yeah, it's like looking into a Freakishly dissimilar, yeah, body yeah. shape, yeah. Um, <clears> yeah, <throat> so in, uh, um, IBS uh, yeah. as well, and we, we'll Irritable talk about the difference syndrome. between IBS and diverticulitis as well, yeah. but um, acute incidence uh, is uh, 3.95 fold higher wow. in people who have IBS. 
So that's interesting. So if you've got IBS, and a lot of people do, and IBS is kind of like a diagnosis where they can't the see what's going on. It's nothing. It's yeah. Sort of kind of, yeah. We just call it a basket diagnosis. Yeah. Because you didn't have Crohn's, you didn't have ulcerative colitis, you didn't have diverticulitis, something with your bowel, we'll just call it an irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. But they don't know what the driver is. I think it's psychologically really. based to serotonin based. Yeah, and, it can be yeah. conflicted. There can be different reasons for, yeah, it, for it. But sure. it's, a, it's a definite condition. It's just yep. they're not exactly sure of the drivers. So, um, so yeah, so there's some. And I, I liked this chart here. And I'll, I won't, well, I can put it up to the camera, but we didn't do it in colour, this oh. one here. Because this is like a progression of yeah. what, but I'll, but I'll explain it because not everyone watches. Yeah. Um, so basically starts out, you can have an altered microbiota. So dysbiosis. Yeah. Or diet, any other issues uh, that might be gone. Tonsillitis had uh, antibiotics. Yeah, anything. Altered by microbiome. So many yeah, people sure. have altered um, microbia. Um, and then so they can have altered uh, and or altered motility. Okay, so, so I get constipation. I'm on steroids and um, I'm, I'm on opioids for pain. I get constipation. Yeah, yeah. so I get constipation. Um, so then you can develop hypersensitivity. Yep. So um, And then that hypersensitivity can lead on, lead on to inflammation. Yep. Then that inflammation can actually lead into symptomatic, uncomplicated diverticular disease. So I've got disease. pain in my guts here. Yeah, which then can lead on to diverticulitis, mm-hmm. which then can lead to post-diverticular um, type do- post-diverticulitis IBS. Jeez. Which then can turn into recurrent IBS, mm. and then if you're really unlucky, segmental colitis. Ugh. So that can be a progression. It just so gets it can, worse. so you know, it can start out just with that ultra microbia, yeah. um, uh, microbiota, uh, or constipation. Yeah. So and then that can be the progression. So well, hang on. How do I know if I've got what are the, the, the symptoms that that that, 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 that this shows? Because I might be worried I might have it. Mm. So um, as, as we said, a lot of times don't have any symptoms yeah, <laughs> unless yeah. it becomes acute. Um, so non-specific abdominal symptoms okay. that are, that can become chronic. Okay. You can't really put your finger on what it is, but it's just that you, it's there a lot. Um, uh, but, and then that can be there in the presence without any inflammation, so right. overt inflammation, so okay. just that sort of um, chronic pain. Yep. Um, you won't see res- in raised inflammatory markers, which we'll talk about as mm. well, um, like you would in acute diverticulitis. Yeah. So um, abdominal pain, bloating, changes yeah. in bowel movements, which could also sound like IBS, right? Yes. Um, uh, it, well, it has a lot of overlap. Mm-hmm. So how do you tell if you've got, if it could be SUD, yeah. um, simple, um, uncomplicated diverticulitis or IBS? Yeah. What, what, what are the comparisons? So we've got a little chart here. Yeah. So demographics basically. So younger females, is, IBS is more prevalent in younger feels, females compared to males. Yep, true. Whereas SUD is more prevalent in older males than females. Yeah. So there's a little bit of difference there. Okay. Um, colonic structural changes, yes, in SUD and no in IBS. Right. Colon that's doesn't that's really important. change structure. Yeah. So, so you could have a, a camera up the butt mm-hmm. and they could see changes yeah. in the sigmoid colon. Yeah. Um, but, but IBS looks normal. It doesn't look any different. Yeah. So. Okay. Interesting. Um, pain patterns are yep. frequently, uh, they're fre- uh, frequent occurrences, but they're quite short lived yeah. with IBS. Yeah. Whereas in SUD, there, there's, um, Longer remission times between pain, but they're more prolonged when you have them, if that wow. makes sense. Um, so um, pain location is diffuse, so basically IBS is yep. all abdominal pain, whereas um, SUD, it's more in the left lower quadrant, as we said. Yeah, left lower quadrant. Now, now yep. people might think, oh, isn't that appendicitis? The appendix on the right side. Yeah. So just so you know, yes. um, if you think, oh, I've got appendicitis because this, this sided pain thing. Yeah. yeah, so that's something. Yeah, and, so that's and, that descending and, and this is very common, this thing too. So. Yeah, so it's so common. What else? Um, and then fe- fecal calprotectin, which we'll talk about as well, which yep. is an inflammatory marker of the um, bowel. Yep. Um, it's usually normally in IBS, but it can be elevated in SUD. So okay. there's some of the difference between IBS. And also this is an interesting one. Um, pain uh, with IBS, pain is usually alleviated by passing gas or passing a stool. Okay. Whereas with IB, uh, sorry, with SUD, it's not. So you can uh, pass gas, pass stool, and still have the pain. Yeah. So that's a bit of a um, bit of a differentiation. That is a well. good one because you know you know when you're young and you oh, go to the toilet, if you got a tummy ache, and it goes away. Mm. Yeah. Um, so this wouldn't. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Exactly. Wow, fascinating. So, so that's an interesting one. Interesting. Um. So yeah, and then uh, acute diverticulitis and complicate uh, so complicated or uncomplicated yep. uh, acute diverticulitis. You have like a triad of symptoms. So. Triad of left side of abdominal pain, yep. absence of vomiting, yeah. generally, 
um, a raised CRP, so um, C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker. Blood test, yeah. Um, you can you can have a sense of fullness. You can have fever. You can ch- have changes in bowel um, patterns, um, and increased white cell count as well in blood testing, which mm. we will talk about. So, okay. so there's some some of the more um, symptoms of acute diverticulitis, yep. um, complicated or uncomplicated. Um, so yeah, so there so there's some of the symptoms of it. So how do we um, look, yeah, how what, do we find it? How, yeah, what are yeah, some of okay. the diagnostics? So, so I think I've got this. Yeah. What what can the test can the doctor or anyone order yeah. to figure out that I've actually got this? What what are some of the tests? So some of them, so CT scan can be one okay. of them. Um, MRIs, MRI, as well. Yeah. You can see that ultrasound. Yep. As well, um, colonoscopy. But again, as we said, um, uh, not everyone's going to be well. That's one way to 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 diagnose it if you don't have any acute um, diverticulitis. But if you do, it's not recommended because ish, uh, risk of perforation if you're having a colonoscopy. So you want to be yeah, a bit careful there. Yeah. But generally doctors will do CT scans or MRIs traditionally or ultrasounds. Uh, the CT three. scan, just, just if you've been ordered a CT, CT scan, just remember you've got to fast before it because mm-hmm. they may give you contrast and make sure your kidneys are working because contrast, they usually give contrast for this test. Mm. So that that's a basically a dye they inject you with to yeah. get better out results. Yeah. So just remember, ask the doctor about fasting before the test mm. and also about kidney function. Mm. It's very important. There you go. So, yeah. Just for CT. But MRIs, doesn't matter the shit what you do. Yeah. All right. Just for CT scans. Hmm. I've got a really good joke about CT Oh, come on, tell us. <laughs> cat scans and, um, oh, no, I can't. I've got, I can't. A, I've got a clean joke about cat scans. Do you? Yeah. Oh, cat scans and lab testing. That's right. That's the joke. That <laughs> oh, is that your joke? Yeah. You tell it, Steve. You're better at them. Well, you know, it's a, you know, I had a had a sick budge, budgie. <laughs> I went to the doctors. I went to the vets about my budgie, and um, she she bought the, this cat out and looked over it and went meow meow, and then this this brought this dog out and it, it went woof woof, and and then um, okay, and the vet said, oh no, your you, your bird's fine, it should be fine, and that'll be four hundred dollars. Thanks. Oh, why is it four hundred dollars? She goes, well. It was four hundred dollars because of all the testing. I said, "What testing? Well, it was the CAT scan and and the, the lab, lab test." test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, terrible joke. joke. Terrible joke. I, terrible. Probably, I probably told it better, but that's okay. Oh no, I, I <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. Really I'm joking. Bad at I wouldn't jokes. know. I wouldn't know. I'm not very good at telling jokes. Go to Rico. What, 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 what other tests can we do? Um, so other tests that we can do mm. to to look for infl- inflammation yep. or, or infection. Um, so fecal cal protectin, yep. which is what I said earlier. So mm. um, that's through, uh, can do it through a stool test, that sort mm. of thing. So that will be quite high when there's a lot of inflammation. Yep. You'll see it quite high in inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's, mm. ulcerative colitis, mm. but it can also be up in um, obviously diverticulitis yep. as well. Um, C-reactive protein, yep. as I said, or even high sensitive C-reactive protein, probably even um, better. Yep. That will shoot up yep. as well. So Should be a below six. Yeah. So I've seen, I saw one uh, recently, I think it was over 100. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's the one we saw, is it? Mm, yeah, they were, oh, that one was quite very, very high. Freaked me out when I saw that. Yeah, so, so that, um, and C-reactive protein, yes, yeah, so, so that's one. Um, ESR is another one, it's a, uh, erythrocy- erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Yep, another so inflammatory ESR, marker. Another inflammatory marker. Um, and then obviously a white cell count as well, so that will go up when there's bacterial infections and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, procalcitonin. So this one's a different one. This one, it, you don't, I don't really order this one much, but it actually is even, it rises even quicker than CRP. So ah. it'll, it'll rise within four to 12 hours, whereas the CRP will rise more within 24 to 38 hours. In, in leukin 6, which is a, a marker that, that comes up a bit later on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that will come up quite quickly. Um, and that's in response to bacterial infection. Mm. So that's another one. Um, vitamin D, very yeah. broad. Um, yeah. Obviously, if you're having a lot of inflammation, the last thing on your mind is worrying about what your vitamin mm. D levels are. But obviously, as we said, low vitamin D mm-hmm. can be associated as well. Um, so there's some of the other tests that you can do. They're more serum testing to yep. have a look at inflammatory markers and things uh, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's so so that's that. And then associated symptoms, things like that. So as we said, um, genetic con- uh, Connective tissue disorders, yep. Ehlers Danos syndrome, and that sort of thing. So there, there's an association. And Marfan's there. too. Yeah, Marfan's. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a bit about Marfan's, Steve. Well, you get abnormal growth of tissue. Like it mainly affects the heart, mm. is what we usually refer to a cardiologist. Yeah. But geez, what a, yeah, that'd be horrible yeah, getting that. Yeah, horrible. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And then other things like hernia, mm. genital prolapse. 
Mm. Which is not uncommon for women. Women and, get it. And all here's the time. another one postmenopausally more women will get prolapses. So and there's that whole fifty to 50 moving to into the sixties. You see a lot of prolapses sucks more in to the sixties. A woman in the sixties these days, doesn't it? it? I guess women particularly that have had children, I suppose, more so. I don't know. Wow. Moves Some of them around. too, isn't it? Yeah. It really knocks them around. Um aneurysms, which <laughs> Yeah, my mum's it's dangerous. Uh, yeah, that, that's good. you've got to be careful with that one. Aneurysm is, is, is obviously sort of where, where things, arteries burst, for example. Yeah, don't say that too loud. My mum's got an aneurysm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My mum listens to these two. In a heart. <laughs> Are you what you can, Yes. Are you serious? I'm serious. That's yeah. very it's serious. It's very, very small, and the doctors aren't worried about it. <laughs> They're not worried about it. Not no. their heart. No, no. Anyway, mum, don't worry. Don't listen to Steve. It's all fine. <laughs> Jesus. Christ. It's very, 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 it's very benign. Uh, benign. <laughs> it's benign. Yeah, okay, all right, just keep an eye on that. <laughs> and then there's diverticular hemorrhage. This is Ugh. a little less common as well. This is where this is bleeding. Yeah. And it's not as serious as it sounds, no. but it's one of the most common causes of um, lower GI breed, yeah. breeding, Bleed, bleeding, bleeding yeah. um, is hemorrhage. So, yeah, so that's that's um, really interesting. Um, aspirin and NSAID use will increase the, the risk of hemorrhaging yep. as well. So that's that's also interesting. Cardiovascular de- disease, obviously anticoagulants and things, things that are yeah. in the blood. So those things like warfarin that people take for clotting and that sort of thing. Yeah, and it usually doesn't have any pain associated with it. So, Ugh. yeah, so with, with hemorrhaging that is. So, yeah, so that's really interesting. So oh, this is this diagram. I thought this was oh, kind of cool. I love this diagram. Yeah, more, probably more so for people watching than people that will yeah, put it up on the screen. Yeah, we've got to explain so it. There, there's four that look like, I'm going to say pimple heads. They do look but like they, pimple they're heads. they're diverticuli. Yeah. So so what's going on? What What's the first one described? So the first one, so this is basically showing what the diverticuli, this is this is the out pouching, so yeah. this is the bowel and then this is the out pouching and there's just four different diagrams and it shows this four different sort of um, progressions to, to the condition. So the first one, um, is diverticulitis, so into a colonic pressure. So that's yep. when we were talking about um, constipation. Mm-hmm. So you're getting increase in that intracolonic pressure, yep. pushes out, creates it out pouching, that sort of thing, um, and can lead to, to diverticulitis. Mm-hmm. Um, the second one there is um, SUD. Yep. So that's sort of the, that progression there. So that altered gut microbi- microbiota, yep. so increasing um, pathogenic bacteria, inflammatory microbes, um, that type of thing, reduction in butyrate-producing bacteria, mm-hmm. which you talk about, creates a low-grade infection when you have a dysbiosis a lot of times. Um, uh, it leads to visceral hypersensitivity, as we said, and then to SUD. So that's that mm-hmm. second diagram. And then the third one is for diverticulitis. So again, diet and lifestyle, alter gut micro, um, microbiota and microbial metabolites. So that's when those um, things like LPS and yep. those sorts of things. Um, that creates a uh, dysfunctional mucosal barrier, mm-hmm. which we'll talk about with one with Acomancia in a minute. Yeah. Um, so imp- impacts that um, gut barrier function, which we've talked a lot, a lot about before, which then creates inflammation, mm-hmm. and then that can create mm-hmm. diverticulitis there. Um, and then the last one is the diverticular bleeding. So um, you have aging, genetics, diet, and lifestyle factors that all create luminal trauma. Ugh. Um, which then creates vascular remodeling, which can create bleeding. So there's a so that I just thought that were really it's cool nice diagrams. Too. Published uh, t- twenty twenty two. Yeah, Tersi. Yeah, yeah. Tersi. I love the names of that. Tersi. Yeah, no, it's a good one, isn't it? But that that's incredible that one because that that shows the progression. Um, it, but you've got to actually treat this. So so. What what have we observed in the microbes? Yeah, so the microbiome. I mean, I'm, we've done quite a few on the microbiome, and we'll probably do more on the microbiome because there's lots of things associated with it. Yeah. But um, disturbances, as we said, to the microbiome. But what they've seen, what what seems to show up a lot in diverticulitis is high levels of Acomancia municipalia. Yeah. So Acomancia is a mucin degrading yeah. bacteria, mm. really important for the overall health of our gut. So yep. as we've said in the past, there is a mucus layer that lines our gut Mm -hmm. wall um, and then the secretory IgA is housed in that as well and that helps with our immune um, first line of immune defence, the secretory IgA. Um, And then acomancia turns over that mucin layer, keeps it nice and healthy, keeps it nice thick enough to to house that secretory IgA. Mm -hmm. Um, But if there's a lot of inflammation, well, what what do you see with inflammation is a lot of mucus production. So you have a high, high turnover of mucus. Um, it's trying to protect that barrier mm. um, by creating, a, you know, um, a protection with that mucus. So um, inflammation is generally the cause of that. So high acomancia levels just shows that that acomancia is 
producing a lot of mucus, which is creating inflammation. Yeah, because some of our listeners might go, Ackerman, seriously, isn't that a good guy? And it is a good yeah, guy. Yeah. But it's like the firemen. You, I always see firemen around fires, right? Mm. But it doesn't mean that firemen cause fires. No. You know what I mean? It doesn't. So that, that, that's what we call association, not causation yeah. in, in the science world. Um, so there's, there's things there, there yeah, markers. So it's, it's trying to protect. So it's, it's like, okay, there's a lot of inflammation here. We've got to create more mucus to protect mm. that gut barrier. Um, so it's trying to do its job, but it's yep. oh, you know it's it's in response to the inflammation. So generally, it, anytime you see a high acumantia levels on a stool analysis, yep. um, it generally indicates inflammation of some type. I know, and you also written here the low levels of butyrate producing microbes, yeah. and one of them is 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 roseberry, which is yeah. a, a fantastic microbe biome. Did you bring this beautiful coloured? I know, chart? and Steve-O did these up super oh, large. Look at that! If you're looking, just with my glasses. If you're looking for, yeah, it's funny. I printed her off the standard <laughs> I A4. See it. And she goes, oh, I can't see that. So, so I had to I blow can it see up. fine without glasses. I just can't read yeah. without them. I can't read without glasses. Oh, well, no. I can read this without glasses. You, <laughs> now, this, this, this microbe it deserves like a, a gold star for what mm. it does in the colon. It does everything to protect mm. against it. Um, you know, it's even very good for things like dementia. Yes. Uh, sclerosis, autism, Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease, depression, schizophrenia, and multiple sclerosis. Um, and, and, and the reason why that is because... It, the gut is very related to the nervous system. Yeah. Um, and, and this really guy good. is is highly protective and it's extraordinarily good for your gut as well. Mm. Inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, no alcoholic fatty liver, alcoholic mm. fatty liver, cirrhosis, pancreas, constipation, gall sense. The whole thing, it's good for it. Yeah. It's also good for diabetes, obesity, mm. hyperlipidemia. It even helps protect against um, um, tuberculosis, um, chronic uh, kidney diseases, it reduces cancer risk. Mm. Great for reducing autoimmunity, great for your heart, and excellent for thieving conditions like leukemia and cystic fibrosis. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like the resume of a, a super bug. It is. It is a super bug. And, and they're good, good super bugs. Super good, bugs good, are bad. Good super bug. So, yeah, rosebury is a butyrate producing bacteria. Yeah. So, um, you know, so Fecali bacterium prinitsi. So, there's, oh, there's, yeah, um, there's a few good um, keystone bacteria that are butyrate producing. So they um, we that they feed we, we give them fiber the the microbes eat the fiber they produce the short chain fatty acids including butyrate so butyrate is one of the short chain fatty acids as you said that specifically will coll- um, protect the colon will keep those um, colonocytes epithelial cells of the colon nice and healthy turning over and keep everything nice so um, butyrate super important so that comes back to fiber. So fiber is super important because yep. it helps to produce these short chain. Fatty it's it's acids quite producing. remarkable because we did a podcast on on influencers fairly recently. It's probably mm. out now. You know mm. what I mean by now? Yeah. Um, and and you know the influencer I talked about was saying that the cancer loves acid. Yeah. And it's like this just shows proves that butyric acid <laughs> yes. is highly anti carcinogenic, yeah. like a lot of acids, mm. ascorbic acid, mm. acetic acid, propionic acid. So you know. You got to remember that when you when you acidify your colon, mm. it's a good thing. Yeah, especially butyric acid. Yeah, exactly. That's what butter was named after. So That's butter's right. High it was butyric it's acid. High in butyrate. Um, butyrate. Butyrate. <coughs> so yeah. So if you're looking at the microbiome, and obviously I do a lot of microbiome testing, oh, so I'm looking at it. this sort of stuff. So I'm looking for acumantia. I'm looking for butyrate. Good levels of butyrate producing bacteria, obviously. And then, you know, you're looking at things like your um, proteobacteria that can produce um, lipopolysaccharides and things that cause a lot of inflammation. Mm-hmm. We've talked about those in the past. So, so that's why you can see how diet is very important in these, or any condition or an overall health. But in these conditions specifically, a good diet full of fiber and polyphenols and things like that so is really important. So we have a white diet like they used yeah, to Yeah, so now we can go into the diet stuff, Steve, because this is interesting because, <coughs> um, and I have had clients come to me in the past that have been put on the white diet. The white diet? That the white diet. racist. Oh, that does sound racist, doesn't it? What's so a white, the white diet, diet before is we get in trouble? It's kind of, it's basically white bread, this, this crappy soft, you yeah. know, supermarket white bread. White potatoes, white rice, everything because it was neutral. It wasn't infl- It wasn't causing any inflammation. So I was taking out all those other foods because they were thought to be inflaming the already inflamed conditions. Jeez. Um, so the white diet has been shown to be completely wrong. Oh, so if no you've got a GP you. that's putting on your white diet, probably find another GP because quickly. Very, very quickly. Um, and the next one is nuts, seeds, and popcorn. Oh, you got to avoid those, don't you? Yeah, I was told that. 
Yeah, that's been in the. Yeah, that's been you know one of the um, treatments for a long time. Avoid those oh, foods because no. they they get caught. The theory was they get Is caught that still in the going? pocket. Have you yeah. heard that? Yeah, yeah, I really? yeah have recently. Yeah, I've had clients that have said they've been put on. i um, told to not eat those foods because they get stuck in the pockets. So I don't know why they're more inclined to get stuck in a pocket than any other to- any other piece of food that you're eating, any high fiber foods, anything like that. <clears throat> Can I give but, you some? Stats? Yeah, you've got some pretty interesting stuff. Like this, haven't you? <laughs> if you eat nuts greater than two times a week, cuts risk of diverticulitis by 20%. Mm-hmm. Popcorn, it cuts a risk by 28%. Mm-hmm. Let's just premise probably natural oh, yeah. popcorn, not the popcorn. Ha- <laughs> butter, butter, oil and salt laden popcorn. Even vegans reduce the risk. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess that would. By about 30%. Well, because they have a higher fiber, yeah. high fiber diet. It's got a lot of color, uh, mm. polyphenols and antioxidants yeah. and the antioxidants. So that's what that. West, Western diet pattern <laughs> increases it by 55%. There you go. The sad that's diet. That's the shit diet. It's yeah. the one that's bad. Every bloody podcast, it's always the Western diet's bad. Yeah. So it's don't so eat bad. it. You know, high, highly refined grains and oh, sugars and processed geez. foods and things like that. So, so I, lo- I love those numbers, though. I love how they've quantified it. Yeah, so I've got a little bit here. Oh, so that, that was it, yeah. the historical recommendations to yep. avoid nut seeds and popcorn in diverticular disease. It has been popcorn. recently retracted. Oh. Well, recently in the last few years. Yeah. Um, because they originally thought, like, as I said, that all these foods would get caught in the outpouchings, get trapped, and then obviously create inflammation and bacterial, in, um, bacterial infection and things like that. Yep. Um, so, uh, yeah, so in that. Uh, there's a health something called a health professionals follow up study. So research research has found an inverse association between nut um, and popcorn consumption and diverticular disease. Now we should explain what inverse means. Some people don't know. The more you eat, the yeah. less disease you yeah, get. Yeah, exactly. Inverse correlation. Yeah. So men consuming these foods at least twice a week had significantly reduced risk of diabetes. I have nuts every day, so I'm safe, aren't I? Yeah, it was looking bad for me for a while back, being <laughs> old and man and you're Western good, you're back on it again. and shit like that. And, yeah. But now, because I eat a lot of nuts. Yeah. And what I will say, look, if you're having a flare, and we'll talk about that, um, of course, some of these could be irritating and it, mm. purely more because they, they're harder to break down, that sort of thing. So any sort of really high fiber foods, significantly high fiber foods could be irritating when you have a, a condition that's very irritated in the mm. t- in the moment. So sometimes you just it's better to um, have foods that are a lot easier on your digestion, easier to digest, sure. broken down, that sort of thing. But I wouldn't be avoiding them o- across the board. You know, if you're not having a flare, mm. that then then there's no Good. reason to avoid them. Um, so yeah, so diet. So we're talking about diet. So diet. Diet, how we can, imp- how diet can impact mm. the um, the progression or you know um, reduce the symptoms of the disease. So high fiber, include your nuts and your seeds and things like that. Sure, it's completely safe. They've been proven to show that. Red meat consumption reduction, as we said, again, you know, I what I say to people is if you're having a lot of red meat, just replace some of it with fish. Oily fish yeah. because you've got those omega three fatty acids which are highly anti inflammatory, really really good for for um, you know so many so many issues cardiovascular no. disease inflammation you know brain health all that sort of thing, um, but yeah reduce your red meat consumption to probably you know you wouldn't I wouldn't be having it six seven times a week every day no. maybe maybe add some chicken some mm. fish that type of thing in there as well so. I, I think I think with that that the red meat is is like a sticky food and it tends to come with with refined grains or chips yeah. or bad true. stuff anyway. That's true. So as long as you're having the red meat and steamed veggies or something, yeah. I think it'd be way better off. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Just as I said, don't char it. Yeah, that char is very carcinogenic. Yeah, it's bloody smoke nice. Smoke it. Though. My partner smokes his meat all the time. Does he smoke oh, his meat? Yeah, he's got a smoker. I can't eat smoke. Oh, yum! Oh, see, men they love smoked meat. I can't do it. I but, love um, smoked meat. It can be a little, can become a little bit carcinogenic because it's a smoke, <laughs> so it's carcinogenic. Cancer? Who gives it? We're not talking cancer. about cancer today. <laughs> Don't about worry cancer. about that business. Um, so the fiber. So there's not a clear recommendation, but those, no. the average would be about thirty grams a day yep. of fiber and Good different one. types of fiber. So there's soluble, there's insoluble, there's yep. resistant starches. Yep. Um, so they uh, they help to feed those butyrate producing bacteria mm. as well, the resistant starches. Um, include bitter f- foods. So yeah. things that are going to help, and we have talked about this in the past too. Things that are going to help with improving digestive secretions, mm-hmm. so your acids and enzyme production, because the better you're digesting your food, 
the health it is for your um, microbiome, sure. for um, motility, all of that sort of thing. So mm-hmm. um, rocket, radish, radicchio, um, lemons, limes, dandelion Yum. greens if you can get them anywhere, even broccoli, cauliflower if they're bitter, which they should be quite bitter. So they yeah. can all be really helpful as well. Um, flax seeds are really good. Yeah, because everyone thought, oh, flax seeds going to get corn. Seeds again. Yeah. yeah, no, flax seeds are really good. <laughs> so they're, they're, um, they, I would say soak them. Or do flaxseed meal, but if you soak them, they've they've got like a mucil, mucil, yeah. mucilogenic quality to them, yeah. so they get quite jelly like. Um, I would say soak them overnight in the fridge, and they don't break down specifically. That's why you can do the flaxseed meal. If you just do the flax seeds, soaking them, yes, you'll get that mucilogenic quality, but yep. you don't actually extract any um, nutrients out of the seed because they'll go straight through <laughs> uh, intact. Yes. <laughs> so you won't, you won't get anything out of it, but the meal you will. So yeah. if you break, break it down. Um, so that's a really good one as well. And then prebiotic foods. So um, they're, very, as we said, very good for um, resistant starches and prebiotics, mm-hmm. very good for uh, short chain fatty acid production, artichokes, bananas, asparagus, um, garlic, um, onions, if you can tolerate it. And if you can't, then you've got to work on that. <laughs> yes. Um, legumes are really good as well. And what I would say about legumes, a lot of people struggle, they react to legumes. And I think a lot of it is they don't prepare them properly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So a, a lot of them, they buy them canned. So there's yeah. the, the, that could be an issue. Um, but soak them overnight and then rinse them mm-hmm. and then use them. So, nice. yeah. And get fresh, 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 bring, or fresh, fresh dried. You know, don't yeah. have any been sitting in your cupboard for five years. Um, so that can be a little bit of a tip with legumes. And if you're a bit sensitive, start small and start with something like lentils mm. because they're a lot a lot easier on the gut as well. Yeah, um, oats as oats, well. Yeah. Obviously really high. If you can tolerate Beta gluten. Glucans and yeah. things like that. If you can tolerate gluten, you can get the gluten-free oats oh, yeah. as well. Yeah. So, huh. so oats themselves, and we just did one on um, gluten-free actually. We didn't mention this in the in that one. But um, Oats themselves aren't gluten containing, but they're always ninety nine percent of the time they're um, they're harvested with gluten containing yeah, true, grains. Yeah, yeah. So there's cross contamination. So they can ah, be quite high in gluten, yeah. but you can get um, sorry, you can get wheat free oats, not specifically gr- gluten yeah. free. Yeah. yeah, so wheat free oats. So okay. um, uh, and berries are really good, full of polyphenols, full of oh, fiber, yeah. and all those colors that sort yeah. of thing. So that's really Yum. good. Um, omega three rich foods, as we said, so the oily fish, salmon, yep. mackerel, ch- trout, that sort of thing. Yep. Yum. Um, tuna, obviously, with tuna, it can be high fresh tuna, high quite high in mercury. So mm-hmm. you want to just limit your intake of that yeah, a little the big bit. Fish, also, swordfish is high. Yeah, in mercury. swordfish, shark, orange roughy, <coughs> the big seven. There's there's a big seven for high mercury fish. Oh, I don't even know. I'd fail that exam. Oh yeah. Well, I'm God. This sh- oh, now I'm going to reel them all up on it. But um, <laughs> but yeah, um, there is a t- yeah. Yeah, well, maybe do a podcast on that, a separate go, podcast on go, that. Going to Melbourne and, you know, everyone eats flake down there, which is I know, a they do. shark. Yeah, we grew up on fish and chips. Well, grew up on fish and chips. We used to have it once a fortnight, I think. I used to have every like Friday that, once night. A week. Maybe it was once a week. I'm not sure. Good but we had flake, battered flake, dim sims, battered. potato cakes. Oh, potato cakes. And it was in paper. What in, they Queensland, call them in Queensland, you don't get. Because scallops? Uh, scallop potatoes. I'm like, what? What the hell what is that? that? A scallop is something else. Yeah, isn't it? scallop. I love scallops. Stupid and also in Queensland, you can't, you don't get it wrapped up in paper. <laughs> they always put it in a tray in in a bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, that is not fish and chips. No, nah. you got to just like put it in the middle of the table and unwrap it. Yeah, that's very Victorian. And tomato sauce. Tomato sauce. Yeah. Lemon, if you yeah. want. Vinegar. My mum said the on vinegar. It. Yeah, I just love it. But anyway, I haven't eaten that for a long time. <laughs> but don't eat that either. sort of thing. But um, but you make high omega three fatty acids. Cooked, so in, fish. Cook, cooked in deep. Uh, Mega six oil that's oh, been yeah, sitting there for great. three years. Yeah, yeah love don't do it. That, love that. So, um, so you know, obviously plant based omegas yep. as well. So flax seeds, hemp seeds, mm-hmm. chia seeds. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, that sort of thing is really important. Stewed apples and pears, which we've talked about in the past, as really well, very good. healing for yeah. the gut. So they can be really good as well. Good. Um, and make sure you're having enough fluid, like drinking enough water, sure. because you want to make sure you're having helping with motility. Mm-hmm. A lot of people really don't drink enough water. So I would say three litres a day, most people. <laughs> I never drink a, a water. I mean, it's no, not. It's got, sort it's of always got something colors, in it, it, isn't it? Yeah, when um, you're here, yes. Today it's got something different to yesterday, but it it's the same sort of thing. Yeah. I won't say what, but peps me up beautifully. You know, Steve just opens the cupboard and just pulls all the stuff out and just makes a big it's concoction. True. And he bounces out of it's here. It's true. I bounce out of here, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, this is good stuff. Yeah. I'm into it. Yeah. And, um... Type of diet that you sh- that seems to be quite um, quite good for for um, reducing flares and helping to manage the condition is Mediterranean diet. Of course, 
It's got that's, old that's Mediterranean the diet. diet. That pretty much, you know, if you. It has literally stood the test of time because it's got obviously it's got the fiber, it's got yep. the legumes, it's got a little bit of grain in there, so um, a little bit, little little bit. Um, it's got uh, polyphenols or the colors. Mm. It's got the healthy fats with the omegas in it as well. Um, so that's a really good diet to to sort of uh, sort of base your eating uh, around. By the way, it's not what Australians would think is spaghetti bolognese, which no, is high pizza. refined white stuff with red meat. <laughs> Yeah, no. It's not that at all. No, it's pizza not. No. It's with, with its processed meat and yeah. flour. Yeah. The worst thing for your bowel. Worst thing for your bowel. Yeah. So um so so there's some dietary things that you can implement to help to manage this condition. Have you got any herbs? What are, what are, what herbs? Yeah. Have you got? So so what we want to do is we want to try to when when you know if you're having a lot of flares, the first thing you want to do is try and calm down the inflammation before you can really do anything else. So you've got to get that inflammation down. So um demulcents are really good for that. So Demulcents are, yeah, the, the, it's an action, so herbs that have a particular action. So a demulcent <laughs> action basically is in, it's um, a soothing and, and anti-inflammatory type action. So it coats tissues, yeah. calms them down and, and that sort of thing. So things like cypriam, I've talked about mm. it in the past. Like it's just, just a, an easy one. Anyone, yeah. You can get it anywhere, anywhere, keep it in your cupboard. Cheap. Mix it up. Don't take it in. Um, there is supreme uh, capsules and things you can take. Yeah. Um, and don't don't put it in something else like a smoothie um, unless you're putting a fairly big whack of it in there. Um, because you want to have it. Uh, you want to have the thickness. So you want to have it actually coating your esophagus and goes all the way through right. your GI tract and coats all the way through. So having it between meals, mix up a paste so it's quite thick. Add a little bit of water till it thins a little bit, but still thickish. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really, really good. It's very nice. soothing. It can be quite healing on mm-hmm. the um, the mucosa membranes as well. Meadow sweet is really good. Great herb. herb. Really, really good really herb. Really good herb. Yeah, marshmallow is another one. Yep. Um, and DGL is so deglycerized licorice. So it's had the gl- uh, glycerin taken out of it, which is the, the compound that can, can increase cause blood issues with blood pressure. Potassium shit, yeah. Yeah, but a very good um, mucosal protectant um, licorice. licorice, so DGL licorice. So so they're sort of things that will help to calm that inflammation down in those in those tissues. Now, we've also got to get rid of the inflammation. So yeah. what, what herbs would you recommend for inflammation? So inflammation, so we all know curcumin is one of the oh, top for yeah. inflammation, isn't it? So so with that, of course, you don't have it with black pepper because no. you don't want it absorbed. No, you want you it don't. to go through you, yeah, exactly. which sounds weird. yeah. But um, yeah, so you don't want it with with the piperin and black no, pepper stuff. No, no pepper in it. So good. um, yeah, our boswellia is another really yep. good anti-inflammatory herd. Um, chamomile is very good as well. It's calming and great, yeah. great to have at night to help you sleep too. Yeah, yeah, and it's anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Um, ginger. Yum. If you like ginger, no, yeah, no, you love ginger, Steve. It's no, your favorite. Really, yeah. Um, this is a really great herb, but it's actually endangered yeah. now, so it's, it's Screw very the endangered. expensive. Our, our clusters are more important. <laughs> it's very expensive. So golden seal. Hydrasis canadensis. Yeah. So yeah. it's very gro- it's a very good um like um mucosal anti-inflammatory, really, really good. Um, but it is very expensive because yeah. Yeah, it's endangered. How much is a litre, a half litre these days? Uh, I, mean, I think it's, I think we looked this up once. I think it's a couple figures. hundred dollars. <gasps> yeah, for 500 mils. I think it was quite expensive anyway. <sighs> um, so, yeah, but it's so very expensive. So, um, but it, you can't have it. Omega-3s, as we said, yeah. highly anti-inflammatory. I prescribe omega-3s a lot in yeah. clinic for, because they just have so many benefits and infl- anti-inflammatory is really, really good. Um, Palmitol methylamylide, right, palmitol ethylamylide, we all, very we, hard to We say. call it PEA. PEA. Yeah, it's really, egg yolks and stuff. Yeah, really good. Um, really good for, for inflammation, for pain, yep. Yep. that sort of thing. Really good. Um, vitamin D, as we said. Well, I've got a family member. A doctor recommended someone, a, a family member of mine take PEA. Really? A doctor? Yeah, a doctor, a medical doctor. I think I've said in a previous podcast, watch this, not watch this space, but watch the space for PEA because I think this, this is emerging to be an amazing compound ah. for a lot of different things outside yeah. of pain. Yeah. So um, methylation, other issues as well. Yeah, which we talked about. that's true. Really interesting. Um, and quercetin and bioflavonoids. Quercetin, I love quercetin. It's so, so, so good. And, so and it's not super well absorbed, so it gets yeah. through. So, again, really good stuff. Yeah, really, really good stuff. So, you're, mean, so you're, <clears throat> you're calming down the tissues and mm. then you're reducing the inflammation. Can we reduce the, the, the hypersensitivity? hypersensitivity? Is there any herbs well? you got for that? Yeah, so curcumin. Oh, my God. <laughs> curcumin is a little. Are you sponsored by curcumin? <laughs> you would think you want to need, but it does so many amazing things. Mm. Um, pomegranate husk. Oh, now, pomegranate yeah. husk, I love pomegranate husk and I'll probably, I think I spoke about it a little bit previously, but I probably might spoke, speak about it more. Amazing, mm. particularly the husk though, it's got to be the husk. Um, it's a selective antimicrobial, so it can help to um, sort of modulate that gut microbiome somewhat, reduce some of those more pathogenic um, bacteria. 
it helps uh, it helps to um, uh, feed the beneficial microbes mm. as well. So it's very good for that. Very good for gut healing. So mm. pomegranate husk, not not the juice. Pomegranate mm-hmm. juice is completely different, and even the seeds have a different action as well. So it's got to yeah. be the husk. It's quite bitter. Yeah, but very very good for the gut. Nice. Um, peppermint and caraway, very good for hyper, uh, official hypersensitivity as well. Mm. Uh, Aberagast. Oh, yeah. About the Aberagast. old herbal. Herbal, yeah, herbal mix. Yeah, if you can get that, that's yeah. pretty good as well. And lemon balm can be quite nice. good as well. So there's some herbs to, re- to reduce that. Um, Anything to help the mucosa? What, what, yeah, so so we've we've calmed down the tissue. Yep. We've reduced the inflammation and the hypersensitivity. Yep. And now we want to try and heal it. Heal it, Because yep. we need to heal it to reduce the flare, to stop that. This is where we need to break that cycle I was talking about earlier. So when someone's on, has a flare, takes the antibiotics, has calms down, has sure. a flare. It's a continual cycle. Mm. We need to try and break that. So this is what this is how we do that. We calm yeah. everything down and then we we need to heal that um, mucosal lining. Mm-hmm. So um, glutamine, it's everyone knows about glutamine. IGA, secretory, it's great stuff. It's so, so, so good. Good so, for bodybuilders, good for all yeah, sorts of things. Yeah, it's good for all sorts of things, but it's just such a good gut healer. Yeah. Um, really good. Feeds the colonocytes as well. It's food for the colonocytes as well, so really good. Um, zinc carnosine, I spoke about this in the past as well. Yes. Zinc carnosine are, are really amazing for healing the gut. Really good for the gut. Yeah, specifically carnosine. Zinc, Not don't just get any zinc. Yeah. Um, the zinc and the carnosine mix, it's um, very, it doesn't absorb overly well, so it stays in the gut. Yeah. So that's where it's really good, has that really healing quality. Um, so that's a really good one. Vitamin A and E, antioxidants, yep. obviously vitamin E. I love, an- I love vitamin E. I use a specific form of vitamin E. So I think we've talked about that in the past and it's, very, it's a natural form. form. Yep. It's oh, a, yeah. yeah, and it's from um, the anatto plant. Oh. Yeah. Sesame seeds used to be the source in my day. Yeah, no, and Atto now. So they See, I don't of, even sell them in practice. Yeah. I don't know where they get it from. Oh, this is a, this is amazing. The one I use is it's very, very good. Um, it, it, yeah, I think you'd struggle to find well, Maybe you find it mainstream. It's a practitioner product. Oh. But, um, but really good antioxidant and, and healing. Um, a DGL again, that's also very healing. <laughs> Licorice, yeah. And collagen, of course. Collagen's yeah. great for the gut. Yeah. The gut's made of it. Exactly. So you want to get some collagen in there as well. Um, and then, you know, all your polyphenols as well. Yeah, That's polyphenols good. to regulate the gut microbiome. Yeah. And so then <clears> what <throat> we started to heal the tissue and now we need to make sure that that microbiome is healthy as yes. possible so that okay. we don't end up having more flares. Yeah. So that's when we have to look at increasing our fibres, as we said, um, you know, all the different types of fibres. Yep. Prebiotic fibres, so GOS, BOS, <laughs> They're really good. Fructo oligosaccharides. Yep. yep. And galacto oligo oligosaccharides. Galacto oligosaccharides. I can't say that three times. Galacto oligosaccharides. Thank you. Goss. Yeah. Goss. Um, they're really, really good. And together they can be really beneficial. Yeah. Now, when we thought about Klebsiella before, Steve. Yes. And what do you got for me? can be quite an issue. Um, Goss. Very Goss. effective at reducing Klebsiella overgrowth. Huh. Yep. I didn't know that. Yep, three to five grams a day. So the the research was well, done on cheap, three easy grams. To get. A, yeah, so easy. And I'll tell you from it because I had high Klebsiella post COVID, um, and I did Goss for a couple of months, and I did a follow up, and no Klebsiella. I don't even bother testing myself for yongs. Oh, there you go. You should do one, Steve. I should look at my poo. Should I look at you? I'll look at your poo breakdown, but not your poo itself. I'm gonna do a look at that. Careful as she says that, eh? <laughs> I'll look at your report. That's as yeah. far as it goes. Um, but yeah, Goss and Foss, very, very good. Um, lactulose is also quite oh, good as yeah. well. It's a prebiotic, really easy to get. You can get it from the chemist yeah. like ten dollars for a half easy, a liter yeah, bottle. It's a sort of be careful laxative. with it because it can be lax- <laughs> yeah, have a lax- <laughs> laxative effect. So you don't want to overdo it. Um, partly hydrolyzed guar gum. We've talked about that in the ah, past as well. Yeah. That's a really good butyrate for but- to feed the butyrate producing nice. um, bacteria. Really good um, for that. Really good for constipation and diarrhea as well, depending on how you dose it. Yeah. So that so that can be really good as well. And resistant starch, which mm. is quite easy. Um, green banana flour, cooked mm. and cooled potato, and things like that. Um, and then probiotics. So mm. we're feeding. Obviously, we, we want to feed the the um, the oh god the probiotics feed. The prebiotics are the food and the probiotics feed that. Yep. So, yeah. So, um, like Dobacillus rhamnosus GG, that's yep. a really good one. It's really good for allergies. It's really good for um, gut hyperpermeability, um, uh, immune function, all of that sort of thing, and high, uh, hypersensitivity as and well. And been around forever and a day. Forever. A really, really good mm. one. Um, Saccharomyces boulardii. I oh, put this in everything. That thing. I love it. I put oh, it in no. so many things. It's, so many things. it's such a good thing. It's such a good. So that's, yes, Saccharomyces boulardii. So that's um, uh, very good at increasing that secretory IgA. Yep. 
in that uh, mucous layer of the gut. Um, it's very good for keeping fungal um, uh, populations under control. So it's a fung, it's a it's a fungus itself, but yep. it's um, it's a non colony forming. So it will actually crowd out those. Um, colony forming fungal um, microbes. So non colony well. forming, it won't grow itself. It won't grow itself, yeah. yeah, but it will crowd out. It leaves less space for the others mm. to grow. So it's really good for that. It's also a really good binder for any pathogens and um, sort of things, the compounds and things in the gut that you don't want there. Okay. So that can be really good for that as well. So I love SB. And spore based probiotics, we've talked about in the past as well. So um, Bacillus um, subtus and things like that. So they're, they're really good and they're very good for people who have a lot of sensitivities yeah. to probiotics. Um, so they're really good as well. Um, so Escherichia E. coli, uh, sorry, E. coli Nissel, 1917, the classic. It's, it's different to the E. coli you get when you get food Completely poisoning. different. So there's good E. coli, there's bad E. coli. Um, so this has been shown to re- reduce flares in a lot of people. Ah, with wow. So, so it's a little bit harder to get these days. And there is another one called, and I haven't, I don't think I've written it down here, um, VSL3, is it v, uh, v Oh, VLS, yeah. VSL3. Yep. Um, but that's quite – that. there's a different formulation now because that used to be very, very good for diverticulitis, ulcerative colitis, mm. that type of thing. But they have changed the formulation a little bit, um, so be a bit more careful about that one. Right. But, um, but, yeah, there's lots of um, – Particular strains that can be really good, your bifidobacterial strains, um, they, they're really good. Um, they feed all the healthy bacteria as well. Um, and and then you want to support – make sure you're having regular bowel movements mm. as well because obviously – that constipation can be a factor. So fibre and then all those, um, you know, prebiotics and things that we talked about, um, flax seeds, chia seeds, make sure you soak your seeds. Yep. Um, I, I think that's much better because it has that action, that mucilogenic action. So um, chia seeds, soak them overnight and your flax seeds, soak them. Um, uh, kiwi fruit's really good. Nice. Red dragon Helps fruit's really good. sleep too, kiwi fruit. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's quite incredible the stuff you've got here. I mean, I mean, the, the thing is all these numbers and bactericillus and bifida this and whatever, I if you've got diverticulitis, this is one of those times where they should see someone like you. Yeah, a lot of it, you can, like dietary changes you can do yeah. yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the herbs, so cipriam is very easy to go out and get. Yep. Glutamine is very easy to go out and get. Yep. Um, those sorts of things. So you can do a lot of this yourself. But obviously if, if you have quite quite acute and um, serious flares and things like that, I think it's seeing a practitioner is obviously to give you guidance. Oh, yeah. But um, but. Look, it's such a prevalent condition and getting more and more prevalent. So that's kind of why we wanted to cover it because we're seeing it so often. Um, but there's a lot you can do and, you know, falling into that. And, look, I also understand how you can't – it's hard to get around it with your anti, um, my, uh, antibiotics and things like that as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people, people that maybe have pain conditions that need pain medication. Mm. So it's very hard – you know, when you, you can't really stop taking those things, but you need to break that cycle. Yes, 100%. Um, and you can break the cycle and you can reduce the flares and then, you know, start to heal that GI um, tract and the tissues and, yeah, you'd be much better off. So Wow. Hopefully so, that's helped some people out there that maybe are suffering with diverticulitis. Even taking Panadol and aspirin increases the risk. Yes. You know, like stress and it's these shitty diets we eat, yeah. getting old, everything yeah. causes this thing. That's why it's so prevalent. Yeah, and I think pain medication, you know, just supermarket brands, oh. people, people, and we've been literally talking about pain earlier and it's just so easy to just pop a pill. You know, just have a little bit of pain, pop a pill. I mean, yep. I have a story from the other day, but I won't tell it. Yeah, but, um, we won't tell that story. <laughs> um but, um, but yeah, and people don't realise that, that the damage they can be doing to their gut. So, oh, yeah. you know, if you really have to take pain medication, then obviously, but, you know, particularly this prescribed. Yeah. But you, if you have headaches or you have pain and you get getting chronic headaches and so you're taking a lot of these um, pain medications off, off the shelf, you want to figure out, look at why you're getting the headaches yes. rather than just taking the, the pills because you are creating a lot of issues within your gut. And if you have genetic propensity and other issues, then, then you you know, that could be why we're seeing more of this as well it's because remarkable. people are popping the pain medications for every little niggle rather than looking for the reasons for the niggle also. Scary stuff. I mean, well, this is about all we've got time for. What an amazing, interesting disease. I think it's really interesting. It interesting I mean, I'm sure the it? people with it don't think it's interesting. No, but no, um, no. But I think it's interesting that it's it's becoming much more common. Cool. So, I'll yeah, so there you go. So hopefully that's helped someone and, um, yeah, that's we'll it. We'll see you Steve next week. We will. See you guys. See you later. Bye. Bye.